do you want to understand O20 and OpenID Connect 1.0 once and for all? Buckle up because we are going to understand why these protocols are the most popular to secure RESTful APIs. Let's go! O20 is an authorization framework that enables a third party application to obtain limited access to an HTTP service. The application might request access on its own name or also on behalf of our user. Have you ever seen one of these screens? If you did, you're already familiar with O20. These are approval screens that let us control which third party application gets access to our data on a given platform. But how do they work? O define four roles resource owner, resource server, client application, and authorization server. To understand this better, let's consider an actual scenario. Imagine we own a Strava account. Strava is a social media platform focused on sports, where athletes can share their workouts, engage in challenges, and motivate each other. Data such as our name, date of birth, weight, list of connections, and workouts are resources that belong to us. We are the resource owners, while Strava is the resource server. Now we have Runalyze, a third-party application known as Client that wants to gain access to some data in our Strava account. What set of credentials should the client use? Would you give them your own username and password? I hope not. O20 solves this issue by introducing a fourth role, the authorization server. Its goal is to act as an intermediary between us and the client application requesting access to our data. In this setup, client application and resource owner have their own distinct credentials to identify themselves. However, the target API cannot be accessed with neither of these credentials. The resource server API accepts only special access tokens that are created and signed by the authorization server. Obviously, the access tokens necessary to access our data are issued only after our own approval. The access token is a special credential with limited scope and expiry. The scope is necessary to limit what kind of operations are allowed to the client. The expiry limits the token validity from a time standpoint. This is necessary to reduce the impact of a malicious actor in case of token interception. The access token can also carry additional authorization data, like information on the issuer of the token, in other words, the authorization server URL, as well as additional customizable details. There is also another type of token, the refresh token. This is simply a special credential used to create a new access token when the current one expires. Refresh tokens are optional and they should at the discretion of the authorization server. As you can see, OAuth does two important things. It removes the needs of sharing credentials between the third-party application and the user. And it allows users to grant limited access to their resources in terms of scope and time. I hope the roles are clear by now. Next step is trying to understand how a third-party client application can gain an access token. And at the same time, our resource owner can grant access to its own data. The answer to these questions is given by the authorization grant types. An authorization grant represents a credentials that authorizes the client application to obtain an access token. In simpler words, there are different flows a client application can leverage to obtain a token. The original standard defined four authorization grant types, authorization code, implicit, resource owner password credentials, and client credentials. Let's start with the authorization code. This is a grant type that covers the scenario that we already described, where a third-party application like Runalyze tries to access our data on a given platform like Strava. Let's have a look at the sequence diagram. The client application initiates the flow by redirecting our browser to the authorization endpoint. It includes some data, like the identifier of the client, request scope, local state, and redirection URI. 
we authenticate against the authorization server and decide whether to grant or deny the access request. If the request is accepted, the authorization server stores the approval details and redirects the resource owner browser to the redirection URI. The redirect includes an authorization code. This is the authorization grant. The client requests an access token using its own credentials and the authorization code. If the request is valid, the authorization server responds back with an access token and optionally a refresh token. Finally, the client can invoke the resource server using the access token. And that was the authorization code grant type, which is the most complex and important in this protocol. If you got this, the rest will be peanuts. So if you didn't get it, you might even want to replay this section till you digest it. Now, if you are security minded, you might have noticed that there are some avenues to attack the protocol and intercept the token. However, I want to deal with these details later on. Let's move to the next grant type that it's quite similar to the authorization code, so we will understand it better if we follow up with it. The implicit grant type is a simplified authorization code flow meant to support client applications running in a browser. The difference between the implicit and authorization code flows is that once the resource owner approves the access request, the authorization server generates immediately an access token rather than authorization code. This access token is included in the redirect to the client application, so we can skip the request where client exchanges the authorization code for the token using its own credentials. The idea was that since the client is running in the browser, there is no point in doing the exchange of the authorization code secured by the client credentials because we have no way to protect them. We have no way to make them confidential. If you notice, I'm talking in the past tense when I refer to the implicit grant type. And the reason it's because it's discouraged. On the other end, as I told you before, I want to deal with the security details later on. So make sure to end till the end of the video. For now, let's move to the next authorization grant. The next grant type is the resource owner password credentials. In this flow, the resource owner discloses its username and password with the client application beforehand. The client application can make a single request with the resource owner credentials and its own client credentials to obtain the access token. This is a very simple flow, but you should use it only when there is a high degree of trust between the resource owner, the user, and the third party application, the client. The reason is that the user is giving its own credentials to the application, so there needs to be a high level of trust. The scenarios where you might be using this are those where possibly you cannot use the authorization code flow. Maybe you're implementing the flow outside the context of a browser, so you cannot leverage redirects. Or you are working in a scenario where your system covers all the roles. So it offers the client application, the authorization server, and the resource server. In that particular case, it might be okay that the user discloses the credentials with your client application. Finally, we have the Client Credentials Authorization Grant, where the client obtains an access token using its own credentials. In this case, the client is not trying to access data on behalf of another user, but it's simply integrating with the system in its own name. That's all. These are all the grant types, and by now you should be familiar and to some extent conversing with most of the O2.0 protocol. You know the roles the authorization grant types, the difference between an access token and a refresh token. However, before we use the protocol, we need to cover some security details as promised. The first topic is that the O2.0 specification does not cover implementation details. This means that adopting RFC 6749 alone says nothing about the security posture of your solution because that one is dependent on the implementation details, which are not present in the protocol itself. 
For this reason, there are other standards that extend O to zero that you need to be familiar with. I'm leaving you a list in the description. And if you have questions or you want clarifications, make sure to write me a comment in the comment section below. On the other hand, if all you want to do is leverage this protocol to secure your APIs, my advice is to never implement it yourself. O to zero is a very mature standard and there is no reason at all for you to implement it yourself. I did that back in 2012 and I regret it. But at that time, I didn't have options. So make sure to stick to code that has been developed by the open source community or by some professional service. Now, before we close the video, there is something we did not talk about it yet, which is OIDC or OpenID Connect 1.0. What's that? Let's discover it. If you notice, the definition of O2.0 states that it's an authorization framework. It's not an authentication framework. But what's the difference between the two? Authentication is meant to identify who or what is performing a request. The authenticated user or application is known as a principal. Authorization defines what operations a principal can do. Despite all 0 was written as an authorization framework, it's obvious that the authorization server needs to authenticate both resource owners and client applications. However, the protocol does not describe how to exchange identity information between the authorization server and the third-party client application. OIDC fills this gap by adding a well-defined identity layer on top of O2.0. In a nutshell, this additional identity layer consists of two concepts, the ID token and the user info endpoint. The ID token is issued together with the access token during the authorization code flow. It's a special JSON web token which carries information about the end user that authenticated against the authorization server. The identity information is structured as claims. This table shows the set of IDC standard claims. It's also possible to add additional custom claims. The ID token does not include all claims by default. This is why we also have the user info endpoint that clients can invoke to access all claims. And that's enough for this video. Let me know if you want more detail about OIDC, JSON Web Token, or possibly best security practices to use O2.0 and OIDC. I also want to thank you because we're reaching the 1000 subscribers, so please keep helping me by subscribing to the channel, liking and sharing the video. Thank you for your time and now time to learn something new.